How many of you are familiar with the TV series called Ancient Aliens? Most, uh, probably a good many of you here. Some, some people were, would, would not, maybe wouldn't raise your hands. Uh, but I will admit that I like to watch that show from time to time. Uh, I, I really, I'll tell you up front, I do not believe that we have been visited by extraterrestrials. Uh, actually, I do believe it, but not the kind that they're telling you about. Not beings uh, from Alpha Centauri or some other you know, solar system, some other place in our galaxy who have come here. You know, I've always wondered about that. Why is it uh, that uh, these beings who have this ability, this amazing technology, the ability to travel across, you know, many light years, something we can't even begin to think about doing, and yet they can do it. They can come here with that kind of technology. Why is it they sneak into people's bedrooms at night? <laughs> can't figure that out yet. Actually, I think there's an answer to that. I think that, you know, you have this similar reports all around the world about uh, these beings coming into people's bedrooms and, and doing uh, what appears to be pranks or, or probes or whatever it is they do with them. And uh, I think there is an answer, but that's a topic for another day. Today, I want to talk about uh, something that uh, you might think is related. You know, the uh, Ancient Aliens program. Uh, is designed to explore evidence that extraterrestrial beings did visit our planet in ancient times. Now there was an episode that aired on December 21st, 2012. I had to look that up. I'm not keeping a record of it, by the way. <laughs> but it was, in, it was entitled Secrets of the Pyramids. And the idea there was the fact that when you find pyramids, or they're not all, they don't all look alike, but they're very similar in structure. But you find them in Bosnia, you find them, of course, in Egypt, as we all know, in Russia, and in the Americas. So you have these structures around the world, pyramids, in cultures, in nations, far apart. And they were built at a time when, obviously, they didn't have mass communication and they couldn't, you know, contact you. People in the Americas can say, well, what, you know what they're doing over in Russia? or what they're doing over in Egypt, let's do one of those. Obviously that kind of communication didn't exist and uh, many of the different cultures didn't even know about the existence of some of the others. And so the idea here in that particular uh, episode of Ancient Aliens was that they had to have help. How could they have known how to make these pyramids, which they speculated on how the uh, these, these uh, alien life forms were using the pyramids, you know, all kinds of things. You can come up, uh, a place to land their craft, whatever. But in any case, uh, they said that these, this, it's, it's unreasonable to think that uh, so many different places, peoples and places, could build these same structures without having some kind of common knowledge. And the only way they could have that is they had to have somebody that can go from place to place. They had to move there real quickly. And as I thought about it, I thought, no, no, there's a better answer. There's a better answer to that. So how is it that all these people living in places separated by many thousands of miles, and in many cases not having even an awareness of each other's existence, could come up with this common design? How is it? I think the answer is in Genesis chapter 11. Let's turn over there. Genesis chapter 11. There's a well-known story here, and I think that this probably, you know, this is speculation, I can't say with definite certainty, but I think it makes sense, that this is probably where it all came from. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 1, now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had bricks for stone and, and bitumen for uh, mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower. A tower. Now we think of a tower as some kind of straight up building, you know, you see the Trump Tower in New York, you see other things that are called towers. But you know, in all probability, these ancient towers were pyramid shaped. So this was probably a great pyramid that they were building. Now think about this. They were scattered from this place all over the world. The humankind was in one place one language, and they were all devoted to building this massive city and this one great tower. 
most likely a pyramid. In fact, uh, scholars believe that, uh, there, that the, the Tower of Babel is really that uh, temple ziggurat of uh, Mordok, that's, an, that's a god that's in Babylon. And uh, that, may well, may, that may, be, may well be the case. It's about 300 feet tall and it is a somewhat, it's a kind of a pyramid. So this is probably a pyramid and when the families of the earth spread out all throughout the different lands, then they had that concept in mind. So then that's why I would say you find pyramid and pyramid-like structures all around the world. Now we're not going to talk about pyramids today, we're going to talk about this text and the importance of it because it says something to us. There is a very important lesson to nations and to individuals contained within this text. Let's continue to read it. Let's read on through uh, verse 9, but let's uh, continue there. It said, Come, let us build a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So they didn't want to be dispersed. They wanted to be this one people with this one language devoted to this one purpose. You know, you think about that. Isn't that a good thing? Doesn't that sound kind of millennial? Doesn't that sound like a unity? And that, it doesn't the whole world talk about unity today? Unity of nations, unity of families, unity among the nations, uh, unity within churches. And yet here we see that some, for some reason God didn't approve. We'll talk about that. Let's just continue reading the text though. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language. Again, isn't that a good thing? Well, maybe not. Maybe not. Continue reading. And this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. I just mentioned in passing that some people have taken this in a very literal way and assumed that this meant that pretty soon they'd have computers and uh, the technology we have today. And I remember very well one person, it was a minister, speaking at the pulpit, actually said that he thought the Tower of Babel was a rocket. And they were <laughs> that the space program had begun. But uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's not the case. I'm pretty sure that's not the case. We'll come back and talk about the meaning of this a little bit later, though. Let's just read on with the text. Come, let us go down now, and there confuse their language, so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, and that comes from a Hebrew word which means confuse, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of the earth. So he did, he caused to happen something that was just the opposite of what they were doing. They wanted to be all together, speaking one language, one people, and one land, and God says, nope, he breaks up the party, uh-uh, you're going to disperse multiple languages, multiple nations, and so on. Now, let's, uh, let me ask a few questions, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, ex we'll explore some other texts that are relevant to this, and then we'll come back and answer those questions before the end of the sermon. Uh, the first thing, one, it says, as I said earlier, one land, one people, one lang language, and that does sound rather millennial at the first glance, had one purpose. And the question then again is, isn't such unity desirable? Or is there something else implied in the story? Something else going on here other than just people unifying and coming together for a common goal and a common purpose. Is there, is there something else going on here? The second question is, so why did God disunify them? This is related to the first. The third question is, what did he mean when he said, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them? Does it mean that they were ahead of schedule in a 6,000 year plan and that they would come up with nukes too soon? 
and that the end would come too soon, so they had to, he had to scatter them and delay, the, delay that so that uh, he could push the 6,000, you know, push it, align what they were doing with the 6,000 year plan. Is that what was going on? You know, a lot of people believe that. A lot of people believe that. And the fourth question is the scattering, absolutely no question about it, the scattering of the people, this was a divine judgment. God came down, the point here is he investigated the situation, and then his judgment was the people will be scattered and their languages will be, will, will be well the language, the one language will be confused. Now, now there will now be multiple languages. So the question here is, was, there, was that also, is it possible that that was also an act of grace? In other words, was this to benefit the people in some way? Doesn't sound like it. Sounds like he thwarted their plan and they were doing well. You know, evidently they had plenty because they were building a great city and a tower. And now he comes down and he interferes with that and he causes them to scatter and go out with their own languages, different languages, and being disunited now. But is there, was there some benefit to them in that? Well, we'll examine that, but before we do, or as we do, I should say. Let's go back to chapter 10 because this, is, this chapter is commonly called the Table of Nations. It talks about the, the sons of Joseph and the peoples who came from them. Now it's important to realize when you look at chapter 10, we're not going to read the whole thing, but just summarize it. It's important to realize that the, the uh, information in chapter 10 or in chapter 11 actually precedes the information in chapter 10. That section of scripture we just read is a summary of how things got this way. Chapter 10 then is what happened after the Tower of Babel. So you, some people could get confused by reading this. They come to chapter 10 and if they, if they read it chronologically right on into chapter 11, they think, well, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. This is a contradiction. Because here you have this story about how people spread out over the earth. And then in chapter 11, you have this story about how everybody was one, one people right there at the Tower of Babel. So it, it, you have to realize that chapter 11 is a summary of, it precedes, it should precede, or this section of chapter 11 should precede chapter 10. So let's summarize chapter 10 then to see what happened. This is after the Tower of Babel event. It says in verse 1, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. I'm not going to read it all, but it talks about the sons of Joseph, first of all. It names several of them. It says in verse 5, from these, the coastland peoples spread in their lands, plural, each with his own language, by their clans in their nations. So he really did divide them, didn't he? The sons of Japheth. You have multiple languages coming from this one son and his descendants. You have multiple clans and nations coming just from him. And then he goes on to talk about the sons of Ham. He names them. And he names one character here that's very interesting and it sheds a lot of light as on the, the, the text we just read from chapter 11. It says in verse 8, and this concerns one of the sons of Ham, his name was Cush. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. That's, that doesn't mean that he was, uh, you know, he was the winner of the world's strongest man competition. This no, something else is in view here. First of all, let's notice the name Nimrod. It means we shall rebel. Ah, that tells you something, doesn't it? Usually in the Bible you see names. Names, the meaning of names is usually significant. We shall rebel. And also it says he was the first on earth to be a mighty man. That is reminiscent of another passage. I bet some of you here know what it is. It's Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 in the pre-flood era. When he says he was the first on earth, meaning in the post-flood era. Look at Genesis chapter 6 for just briefly. Genesis chapter 6, you see the similar language here. Verse 4, it says the Nephilim, that means giants, were on the earth in those days and also afterward 
if they were on the earth in those days, what does it mean? The days prior to the flood. And also afterward, meaning what? The days after the flood. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men that they bore children to them, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. There it is, mighty men. What does it mean? These were the sons of the tyrants. Tyranny was in the earth in those days. That was the problem. These were the sons of the tyrants and they continued their father's programs. And so that's why there was great violence in the earth. That's why it ultimately led to the great flood. Because God was sickened by what he saw in the creature, the beings who bore his image. So he brought about the great flood. So back to the, our text in chapter 10, we read about Nimrod, whose name means we shall rebel, and who is the first on earth to be a mighty man. In other words, he was a tyrant. Verse 9, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That just doesn't mean he, just, he was really good at bringing in the, the venison and all of that. No, no, he was, he, this, he was exalted above the people. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his, to get this, his kingdom was, there it is, Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. That's what we just read over in chapter 11, isn't it? From that land he went into Assyria and built Nineveh, and it goes on to tell about him. But the interesting thing here is we see that Nimrod, whose name means we shall rebel, and he's, so, he's called um, the first of the mighty men in the earth. That means he was a tyrant. He had a kingdom. It says it was in this same place we just read about. So the Tower of Babel event. And the people, when they came together, united. This is all the children of Noah. When they came together, united. I'm talking about the descendants of Noah by this time. Uh, probably quite great in, in number. Uh, they were under this tyrant, this rebel called Nimrod. And the implication throughout the whole thing is that they were in agreement with him. So what's going on here? What's really going on here? Well, the fact is that they were turned, they had turned from God. And they would in the days ahead as they built, they built the great city and this, this tower. You know what the tower really was? It was a monument at least a symbol of their own greatness. It was not to the glory of God. It was to their own glory, their own greatness, and it symbolized it. Now there's something in the text in chapter 11 is quite interesting. You know, here you have this tower, it says it goes into the heavens. That means that they looked upon this and they saw their greatness. Guess how great they are? Well, the tower that stands for their greatness extends into the heavens. It's like a stairway of the gods. And yet, something very interesting, it's really subtle, it's in the text here. It says that God had to come down to see it. You get, the, you get that message? You get what it means? As great as man is, and here is the pinnacle of his greatness represented by that tower, and still, God, so high above his creation, Now I'm not talking about just in distance, I'm talking about his greatness, his eternality, has to come down to investigate. So I think there's a little message there. And what does that tell us when we think we're so great? Whereas my mom used to say, you think you're too big for your britches, don't you? I don't know if you ever heard that expression or not. Yeah, some of you, you have. So this is what's going on. And the problem there was that they were actually turning away from God. Now then, let's, uh, let me answer these questions, the questions I raised earlier. Uh, the, first one, the first one being, and I think you already see the answer, uh, you know, you have this description of one land, one people, one language, one purpose, and isn't such unity desirable? Well, unity is desirable when, when the people who are unified are under the power of God, when they submit to God. This is not what was going on here. 
They were, the, the, what was happening here was nothing less than rebellious pride. And that tower was a symbol of their pride. So yeah, unity is great if God is placed first. So the answer to that first question is no. And the key is in uh, Genesis 11 to verse 4. You know, the key to understand what was really in their minds. Remember what it said there in Genesis 11 and verse 4? Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. There's your problem. There's your problem right there. And that means that they were going farther and farther from God as they continued to build and make a name for themselves. And the great tower was built on their own, as I said, their own, not, on, not to the glory of God, but on their rebellious pride. This was for self-glorification, not to the glory of God. You see the same thing. Let's go over to Isaiah chapter 14. You see the same thing there. And this is a poetic taunt here concerning the king of Babylon and his kingdom. Uh, it tells us right there in the beginning, says, uh, it tells, Ezekiel, it tells uh, Isaiah, to, says in the last part, latter part of verse 4, take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. In the Hebrew, that word translated taunt here, it refers to a, something like a proverb. In other words, a, a symbolic or a figurative way of describing uh, the, the wickedness of this king and his kingdom and of the greatness of his fall. And he goes on to uh, talk about that. Let's see. Let's take up the account there in verse 12 and see if you don't see a resemblance with the people at the Tower of Babel. It says, How are you fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn? And probably what's in mind here, you understand this is highly symbolic language, is the planet Venus. You know, Venus, you see the glory, that means how, how brightly it shines in the morning. It's the day star, the morning star, or the shining one. And it climbs in the heavens until finally it's uh, overtaken by the sun. But can you imagine this? You see the, that, that shining star, and then it comes, down it comes to the earth. That, 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 is, that would be a, a breathtaking thing. And he said he's comparing the fall of Babylon and its, its king uh, to that. He says, how are you fallen from heaven, O day star? Now, the devil may also be in the background. I'm not to, taking issue with that. I'm just pointing out. Uh, I just want to show you the similarity here uh, with what was going on at the Tower of Babel. How are you fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn? How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, now get this, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. That's kind of like building a tower up to the heavens, isn't it? I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly. In the far reaches of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. That's exactly what they were doing at the Tower of Babel. That's what Nimrod himself was doing. But then he goes on to describe the fate of the king of Babylon and the fate, of course, of the people of mankind uh, at the time of... Uh, uh, the gathering at Shinar and the building of the Tower of Babel uh, was the scattering. Also, in, uh, we're reminded of Deut Deuteronomy chapter 8. Let, let's go ahead and turn there. Deuteronomy chapter 8. This is a warning God made to Israel. In chapter 8, beginning in verse 11, it says, Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments and His rules and His statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God. Drop down to verse 17. Beware, lest you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You see, God promised to give them wealth and greatness. They would be set above the other nations of the world. He would multiply their herds and their, their flocks and their crops. And he would give them wealth. But they had to remember that he was the one who was the source of their wealth and gave them power to create wealth, as it goes on to say here. 
When you lose sight of that, then you begin to say, look what I have done. And then all you do is no longer to the glory of God, it's self-exalting pride, it's to yourself. That's what was going on in the Tower of Babel event. Now, is there a lesson? Now, this is talking about nations and peoples and so on. You see at the Tower of Babel, the peoples, all the peoples of the earth. And then they were scattered, of course, as a result of this. But is there a lesson in this for our nation today? It's talking about ancient peoples here, but what about our nation today? Yeah, what about other nations of the world? Absolutely. Do you think you see it in the world today? People doing things and taking credit for themselves and not giving credit to God and even rejecting God? That's what was going on back at the Tower of Babel. And God knew that if this continued, they would move farther and farther and farther away. So there are lessons for nations today, but each of us individually, there's a lesson here for us too. Because nations are made up of individuals after all. Their families grown large, as someone said. And families are made up of individuals. And it begins with the individual, and we're reminded from all this that pride goes before the fall. Pride goes before the fall. The second uh, question, actually related to the first, I really think we've already answered it. Why did God, uh, why did he disunify them? Here, there, they, they were unified. Why did he disunify them? Uh, and then the answer simply is because their unity was not built upon the goal of glorifying God and putting him at the center of their existence. That's why. It, but it was upon their own arrogance and their own rebellious Pride, which as we see was God defying and would have grown worse over time. And that brings us to the third question. The third question, what did God mean when he said, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them? I don't believe this means that, uh, that they were ahead of schedule on a 6,000 year plan. I don't think that's what he has in mind. What he's saying is, very simply, is look, this, they were. They were building a great city. They'd, they'd gotten the materials. They had the materials to build this, this huge tower extending into the heavens from their point of view. Probably extending hundreds of feet up into the air. And as I said, a monument to their own greatness. And what God means is that they will continue this and they will keep on building and building and there will be more monuments and more things that they do. Now they might eventually have gotten into uh, you know technology and all that, technological advance, but that's not, as, that's not what is in view here. What is in view here is the fact as they built to themselves they would they would actually enhance and uh, it's, perhaps that's not the best word but they would actually grow worse what do you do when you when you when you feed when you feed something already it's a, you, a you, you feed that ego you feed that pride what happens does it go away no no it worsens doesn't it it goes greater grows greater and greater and of course that means repentance is eventually just shoved right out of the possibility of any possibility. There is no possible room for repentance at the end of this. So now do we see why God had to scatter these people? Which is exactly, well it leads right to question four, the scattering. No question about it, it was a divine judgment. But was it also an act of grace? I think you can see it is. Was there benefits to it for the people? Absolutely, because it stopped them from doing what they were doing in their self-exalting pride and put them in a different set of circumstances so that they would be shocked into some awareness of what was going on. The Apostle Paul addresses this very thing in Acts the 17th chapter. Let's go over there and take a look at that. Acts the 17th chapter, he actually refers back to this event. Remember here he's at the He's speaking to the people on Mars Hill. Let's just take up the account there in verse 22. It says, So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I pass along and observe the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. So now Paul is going to take advantage of that. 
in order to get his message across. He says, What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Nor is he served by human hands. In other words, he's telling how high above the world God is. How far removed he is in that sense. As though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life, breath, and everything. And he made from one man, you could take this as Adam or Noah, either one. Doesn't matter, it's the same. Every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. That, that language sound familiar? It ought to because we just read it back in Genesis 11. This is exactly what he's referring to. Having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places. Now what does he mean by that? How did he determine the boundaries of their dwelling places? By inter intervening and changing the boundaries they had imposed. So in so doing, in scattering them away from the land of Shinar that they had chosen, they'd chosen their own boundaries, he scatters them and in that way he determines the boundaries of their dwelling places. All the nations under that. Now why? Why did he do this? Paul answers the question right here. That they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. That was the purpose for the scattering of the people at the Tower of Babel. So that they might seek God. Now how would that, how would that work? Well, first of all, it takes them out of that environment where their pride is going to be continually multiplied and added to. And it, take, it puts them into isolation. And when you're in isolation, away from the comfort zone, then you're more likely to call on God, aren't you? That's what was happening. That's what this text means here. So in their isolation, far removed from the city whose foundation was rebellious pride, the scattered peoples are far more likely to seek God. So yes, it was an act of great grace. It was an act of mercy and kindness on the part of God. He had in view their repentance. And you know, that's always the way it is with divine punishment. God doesn't punish just to see people suffer. He doesn't punish because he wants to hurt you. He punishes us, you know, every son he disciplines. Sometimes it's painful, but you know what? It's for our benefit, it's for our good. He does that to nations and he does it to individuals. And these uh, examples in scripture tell us just that. Now turn back with me, I'll talk about another city, a different city, it's in Isaiah chapter two. This is one I would dare say that you and I want to be a part of. I want to be a part of that city that built, was built at Shinar. But this one I think we want to be a part of. In Genesis, or Isaiah, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 2, the word of the Lord, the word that Isaiah, son, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. You, you see this language here? highest of the mountains. We're talking about a great city here, isn't it? But this is not one built on human pride. This is not one run by a tyrant, a godless tyrant. This is something else. And shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it, and many people shall come and say, now this is kind of a coming back together, isn't it? Now this is the kind of unity that the world needs. And say, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares. You see what was happening in, in the... In the tower, at the Tower of Babel, they were going right back to the days of Noah when God had to destroy the world with a flood. You had a tyrant who rose again. You had the same godless society beginning to form. And that's why God had to scatter them. They were going back 
to the, what got the, that resulted in the, the very condition that resulted in the flood to begin with. And you, know, you know also there's a pattern there that we can look at, a pattern that should be considered. Adam and Eve, because of rebellion in the place, in, in this one place that was their home, what happened? God drove them out. The people of Israel in this one place that God had given to them, the promised land, because of rebellion, what happened? Driven out. The people at Shinar, the human race, because of rebellion, what happens? They were driven out. In each of these cases, it was not merely punishment for the sake of punishment, but punishment for the sake of bringing about the change God wanted so he could work with people, so that repentance would occur, so that reconciliation with God and what God wanted from them for, from them from the very beginning could take place. That's what we always have to keep in mind when we read about divine retribution. He said, they shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. In other words, it'll be just the opposite, just the opposite of what happened before the flood and what was about to happen after the flood, what would have ultimately uh, happened after the flood. But you know, there, there's a, before we can get to there, before we can get to that state of being, uh, we have to realize that there is more divine retribution, more judgment to come that will take us ultimately there. And that's in it. Look, look, continue on in chapter, in the same chapter there, verse 12. For the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up, and it shall be brought low. Against all the cedars of Lebanon, he's speaking figuratively here, lofty and lifted up, and against all the oaks of Bashan, against all the lofty mountains, and against all the uplifted hills, against every high tower. It rings a bell, doesn't it? And against every fortified wall, against the ships of Tarshish, against all the beautiful craft, and the haughtiness of man shall be humbled, and the lofty pride of men shall be brought low. And the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. That is the end result. The scattering of the people, ultimately, they will be brought back together, but they've got to go, they've got to learn this lesson. God is to be exalted. We are to be humbled. And as I said before, you know, that's a nation, that's a lesson for the nations. It's a lesson, it's a lesson for churches. It's a lesson for all of us. But it's also a lesson for each one of us individually. And I'd like to close with James chapter 4. James the fourth chapter. A wonderful lesson here. Powerful scripture we should all take to heart. Beginning in verse 3, James chapter 4, beginning in verse 3. You ask and do not receive. Now why? That means you ask, you ask God and you do not receive. Why? Because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, I think he's speaking figuratively here. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is of no purpose that the scripture says, He yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. Meaning that God cares about what's in our minds. He cares about how we direct our emotions. He cares about how we view Him in comparison to ourselves. He cares about this. And He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God, opens, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. It all comes down to this final statement. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you.